Chapter 4. Strange Conversations Osborne beckoned everyone forward. Honored guests, we present King Jacon Falreek, our ally from the Stone Tree Nation of Stormwings, and his vassal, Lord Rakash Moonsword. They will join us. He didn't seem to care whether or not his guests wished to meet Stormwings. Coolly, he presented each of them to the Immortals by name. Duke Gareth, bowing to them in greeting, caught a face full of Stormwing odor and coughed. Dane watched the Immortals as the introductions unfolded. Jacon stared at those being presented, not bothering to speak to them. The only time he showed emotion was when he saw Kitten. He frowned and murmured to his companion. Rakosh glanced over. Seeing Kitten, he found Dane and scowled. His face will freeze like that if he isn't careful, muttered Dane, shifting Zek from the crook of her arm to her shoulder. Undone last a year ago, Rakosh had acted for Osorn in the plot to overthrow King Jonathan and had lost to Dane and Numer. They were the last of the group to be presented to the Immortals. Jacon paid them no more attention than he might a fly on the wall, but Rakosh baited her. We've met, he said coldly. Moonsword? She had never known his last name. That's very pretty. The Stormwing grimaced. My ancestors were a sentimental lot. I know you too, mage, he told Numer. I remember the onion bomb you threw at me. Osorn smiled. Lord Rakosh, did you not say the wild animals of Dunlath behaved oddly? I certainly did, the Stormwing replied. You have Dane to thank, said the Emperor. She is bonded to animals through wild magic. The look on Rakosh's face was one of mixed rage, chagrin, and laughter. King Jakon turned watery eyes on Dane. Some day we must meet less formally when you are not protected by your host. There was an annoying hint of a whine in the king's nasal voice. We will discuss a number of Stormwing deaths that are laid to your account. Any time, Dane told him, smiling as sweetly as she could. Numer bowed and nudged her to do the same. Once they were away from the Emperor and the Immortals, he murmured, This visit gets better all the time, doesn't it? Dane nodded. She wasn't sure how she felt about seeing Rakosh again. He was a Stormwing, a race of Immortals she hated, but personally he hadn't seemed to be such a bad sort. There you are! Varys, in a red satin gown that fitted like her skin, took charge of them. Numer she guided to the very end of the head table, far to Osorn's right. The only seat next to his was the one she would occupy herself. Dane, feeling cross, realized immediately that the woman had arranged things so that she would have Numer all to herself. With Numer seated, Varys led Dane to the opposite end of the main board, where Prince Kadar waited. Dane curtsied slightly, pleased by the elegant sigh of her skirts, and once more silently thanked the queen for her wardrobe. She never could have faced these elegant people in the clothes she normally dressed up in, a blue wool gown for winter and a pink cotton for summer. Even in these garments she couldn't hope to match the prince. He was as finely dressed as he had been on the ship, in a calf-length robe of fine wool tinted a delicate aquamarine, and a shoulder drape of white silk shot through with gold threads. He glittered with jewels. Against his dark face, his eyes could easily have been black gems, for all the emotion they showed as he bowed her to her seat. "'You'll be fine with his highness,' Varys told Dane, and left them there. Kitten, unnoticed by Varys, sat up on her hindquarters and chirped, drawing a smile from the prince. "'I don't know if your food will be very good for her,' he admitted. "'She eats anything,' Dane replied. "'Trust me.' Kadar lifted a hand, and a male slave appeared by his elbow. An exchange of whispers resulted in a stool being produced for Kitten. Discovering that she could see over the table if she sat on it, she cheeped and whistled softly. "'She's thanking you,' explained the girl. "'And so do I. It was a very nice thing for you to do.' A smile tugged at Kadar's mouth. "'I read the dragons are curious about everything.' Dane nodded. "'They understand as much as two-leggers. More because they know the speech of animals as well as human tongues.' I can't speak dragon, but if she wants me to understand her, she makes her meaning clear. Osorn clapped his hands. Slaves began to move in streams, bringing dishes to the diner so that they could select what they wanted. Female slaves, wearing loincloths and nothing else, went from guest to guest, filling wine goblets. For Dane and Kadar, the dragon was clearly a safe topic of conversation. Her weariness of him began to fade when she found he asked intelligent questions and listened to her answers. The moment he felt his friend relax, Zack popped out of the sleeve where he'd been hiding and climbed onto Dane's shoulder. 
For a moment the prince struggled with well-bred dismay, then suddenly grinned, for the first time looking like a young man not much older than she was. Anyone else? he asked. A sparrow in your pocket? A snake as your belt? Dane blushed and looked down. No one else. Zek just doesn't like to be parted from me. I think he's so relieved to be in my care that he doesn't want to let me out of his sight. Understandably, replied Kadar, stretching a hand out to the marmoset. Zek observed his fingers with the same grave air as he did everything, then climbed on. With that, the ice was broken between prince and guest. They talked about a number of subjects, comparing stories of their lives. The only awkward moment came when a slave arrived with the meat course, antelope steaks. Dane swallowed hard. She had managed skewers of roast duck and peppers, smoked salmon and herring, and tarts filled with cheese and ham. She had even tried snails and garlic butter. At the risk of giving offense, she could not eat this. Worse, she knew Kadar was bound by social custom to eat only the things she did. I'm sorry, she whispered. I can't. Kadar frowned. Please? They're my favorite. Her cheeks went hot. Look, don't mind me. You go ahead. It would be churlish of me to eat something that causes you distress. Kadar sighed and shook his head at the slave, who removed the offending dish. At least tell me why. Dane rubbed her face tiredly. What do you know about me? About what I can do? Well, you heal animals and talk to them inside your head and they do your bidding. You won't like that, Dane told Zek, who was investigating a small dish of hot peppers. To Gadar, she said, I ask them to do things most of the time. I don't like to order them around. Would your friends like it if you always told them what to do? Thin lips twitched. Point taken. So you ask them to do things, and you talk to them and heal. I can also be them. I learned how to shapeshift a year ago. My first mistake was when I thought I'd tried deer shape one day last winter. See, I didn't know the royal huntsman would be out looking for some game. I think I can see where this is going. He watched her with interest, leaning his cheek on one hand. So you can't eat deer. Last spring we were rounding up killer unicorns and bandits cornered me. I'd gotten separated from Numer and panicked. I changed into a wild goose. Remembering, she sighed. Big mistake. There was sympathy in his voice. They got me with a barbed arrow. I escaped, but almost lost the arm. Anyway, ever since I could take on a creature's mind or shape, I can't eat game of any kind. I eat fish and domestic meat like beef and chicken, but then I never wanted to be a fish, and I close out the thoughts of barnyard animals. I'm sorry. I used to hunt and eat game with the best of them, but not any more. The prince looked thoughtful. So there are drawbacks to your power. There's drawbacks to any power, your highness. Musicians had entered the room as they talked. Now, in the cleared space before the main board, acrobats started a whirling, athletic dance. Kadar was feeding bits of smoked eel to Kitten, leaving the girl free to admire the performance. When it was over, she remarked she'd never thought two-leggers had that much bend in them, which made her companion laugh. The acrobats were replaced by a number of unusually small black men and women and their animal companions. One old man held the leashes for a pair of tall, rangy, spotted cats. Two girls carried an assortment of monkeys, while dogs of varying sizes and colors followed the entire company. The moment they saw Dane, all of the animals broke from their handlers to go to her. Quickly, the girl stood and walked around to the front of the table, knowing that they would knock the table over to say hello if she didn't. Zek squeaked in fear and burrowed under Kadar's drape as one of the cats rose on its hind legs to plant his forepaws on the girl's shoulders. Dane petted her new friend. Hello, you're a beauty, aren't you? Silently, she asked, how do they treat you, these trainers of yours? Do they hurt you to teach you things? In Tortal, she'd found that many animal trainers used pain to make lessons stick. The animals gathered around were quick to reassure her. Our two-leggers are wise, the cheetah male who laid his paws on her shoulder said. They speak almost clearly as other beast people do. They never hurt us. Dane saw why as the trainers, none of them taller than her earlobe, came to her behind their animals. Flashes of copper fire, wild magic, sparked in their eyes and around their hand as they chattered in word-like sounds. One woman coaxed the cheetah back from Dane, but the monkeys and dogs crowded into his place. They are Banjiko tribesmen from Zalara in the south. Emperor Azorn had left the dais and come over to the group. They are saying that they think you are a god. Someone laughed. Dane turned red. 
Please excuse me, but I'm no such thing. You are God, said the oldest man in heavily accented common. I am Tano, the cat man. The cats come to me, also to my wife. We have cat children. Dane realized his face was tattooed with feline whiskers and ears. Chulumbi is dog man. The man thus named raised his hands to show dog pad tattoos on his palms. Twins are monkey girls. The young women with monkey-like tattoos bowed and grinned to Dane. See, we all one kind beast. If you are not God, then you God child, yes? Which God? Her blush worsened, and Dane knelt to bury her face in the female cheetah's fur. The cat chirped. I don't know who my dad is. She wouldn't have minded telling these nice humans in private, but doing so in front of the emperor hurt. My ma died before she could tell me. The banjiku chattered briefly. They think it's too bad you don't know your father. Numer had also come over. They wished they knew his name. They would sacrifice to him and ask him to visit their daughters, as he did to your mother. Dane was about to protest that she was not the child of a god when she remembered visions she'd had since her mother's death, of her ma doing everyday tasks in a forest cottage. All included a horned man with hints of green in his darkly tanned skin. Could it be? Ozern watched Dane and Numer, face unreadable as he waved a jeweled fan idly. The Banjiku skill with animals is legendary, he remarked. It was through their legends that your teacher came to believe in the existence of wild magic. It seems he was right, in this case at least. And now, if they would be so kind as to do the work for which they have been summoned? The Banjiku bowed to Dane and moved into place for their performance. She returned to her seat and watched the entire thing without seeing it. Surely it wasn't possible that her dad, unknown for all these years, was a god. And yet, Ma had always told her that she'd been conceived in the forest on Beltane, and that her father was a stranger. Applause brought her back to her surroundings. The Banjiku and their animals had performed beautifully and were leaving the room. Dane nodded when the Catman winked at her. They would see each other again. The banquet over, the Emperor's guests returned to the reception area. Musicians played in a corner while slaves offered pastries and drinks to everyone. Dane was talking about the habits of griffins with Numer and Lindel when a slave approached, pushing a wheeled cart. Perched on its surface was Rakash. Jakun had left during the banquet, but evidently his vassal had other plans. Go away, he ordered the slave, then nodded to Numer and Dane. Zek, on Dane's shoulder, craned forward to stare at the immortal, holding a tiny paw over his nose. Rakash grimaced at him. Still consorting with tree rats, I see. Dane smiled. Rakash's last encounter with her had involved a squirrel named Flicker. Now you know what disease the Dunlath animals had. Was that you, shape changed? he asked. The girl shook her head. Not then. I had just learned how to put myself within an animal's mind. Flicker and the eagle were helping me. Shapeshifting ghost, that skill, the Stormwing Lord pointed out. I would have thought you would know that by now. Numer grinned. She does. How delightful for us all, the immortal said, voice extremely dry. I must remember to give Tortle a wide berth. Idly, he scratched the brass that sheathed the top of the cart under his feet, drawing squeals from it with his steel claws. Dane gritted her teeth. Numer winced. Lindel bowed. If you will excuse me. He patted the humans on the shoulders and left. We were having a nice talk before you came, Dane informed Rakash. I am devastated to have ruined your fun. Looking down, he asked in a very different voice, Do you hear from Mora of Dunlath? She writes Dane often, said Numer. She misses you, Dane told the Storming. She says her guardian is nice, but he doesn't have your sense of humor. You could visit her, you know. She'd like that. Rakash pried up a bit of the metal he stood on. I must remain here with King Jacon for now, he replied. I believe my stay will not endure for much longer, and then I may be free to pursue my own life. If that is the case, I would like to see Mora again. Oh? Numer asked. It sounds as if you anticipated a momentous event. What is it? Rakash looked at him sharply, then grinned. Finish your business here quickly, mage. Karthek's unhealthy. It will get worse before it gets better. To Dane, he said, Frankly, I'm surprised to find either of you at this court. It is wise to make a peace with the man who tried to overthrow your king. 
It's very wise, if the greatest army and navy are on your enemy's side, Numer said dryly. Dane toyed with the silver claw at her throat. It's no different from what you did, is it? Prakash stamped the pulled-up brass into place. What is that supposed to mean? Don't play innocent. It was such a relief to be able to speak her mind to someone. Rakash, at least, would never complain of her lack of diplomacy. We've seen the menagerie, Lord Rakash. They have one of your queens and her consort here. Kitten whistled confirmation and silence when the stormwing glared at her. You are wrong, he said flatly. There are no queens missing from the other flocks, and I have no queen in mine. The old one was slain in combat by King Jacon after our custom. Then maybe the prince was mistaken, said Numer with a shrug. He seemed convinced that Barza was a queen. Rakash's steel feathers ruffled, then settled into place with a series of muted clicks. What did you say her name was? Barza, Dane replied as she scratched Kitten behind an ear. Her consort was named Hebek. The prince said that their being in a cage here was the price of the alliance with King Jacon. Rakash's frown deepened. Suddenly he leaped from the cart, wings pumping. Guests scattered as he flew through the window into the night. In his wake, nobles and slaves alike struggled to repair their dignities. I wonder where he was going, murmured Numer. Is it possible he did not know of Osorn's special menagerie? And what was that about the health of Karthek? Dane chewed her lower lip. She had a feeling her kosh meant the same thing the badger had. I don't like all this, Zek told her. Back home, we know the feeling of a coming storm and we hide. This feels like a really bad storm in the air, but it doesn't smell like water. What does it smell like? Dane asked silently as Numer went to find Lindel. Zek thought for a moment or two, tiny nostrils flaring as he took deep breaths of the air. Fire, he said at last. A storm of fire. Soon after that, Dane found the Emperor at her elbow. Fair the Dane, good evening. The birds have been left all day, as you ordered, he said, offering Kitten one of his rings to play with. Can they be visited tomorrow? Dane nodded. Off and on during the day, she had called to the aviary with her magic, touching the minds of the occupants to see how they did. They'll be up with the sun if they can see it. I should warn you, they'll be fair hungry. Figure they'll need at least double, probably triple rations. The Emperor smiled. Dane realized that his watchful air vanished only when he talked about his birds. They shall have them, he promised. You may ask any price of me, any reward. I got the only reward I want, knowing they're better. I'm not always lucky enough to save animals when they're sick. Sometimes they die no matter what I do for them. It happens often enough that I never get tired of making them well again. Kitten offered the ring back to Osor with an inquiring whistle. Smiling, he replaced it on his finger, then vanished. Kitten squawked her irritation. Dane sighed, feeling as if she'd been clamped in a vice for hours. She yawned and stretched. Let's get some air, Kit. With a cheerful whistle, the dragon led the way onto the terrace. Prince Kadar found them there, watching the moon rise. This is beautiful, Dane said, waving at the formal garden lying off the terrace. It was laid out in patterns, with hedges and flowers forming precise, graceful curves and spirals. We don't have anything that's this fine. Your king spends his money on very different things, replied the prince, watching the silver-gilded pattern. Before she could ask what he meant, he said, I have to go, but I wanted to ask, would you like a guided tour in the morning? I could meet you when your friends leave for the talks. Your Duke Garrus said it was all right when my uncle asked him. Dane inspected his face. Are you sure you don't mind? I would be at loose ends, it's true, but I can always amuse myself. He grinned, teeth flashing wickedly. I would like something to do, frankly. We're between quarters at the Imperial University, and there's little going on for me until classes start. Then I accept with pleasure, she replied, seeing no resentment in him. I'll come for you tomorrow when the talks open, he promised, bowing over her hand. He left her there, and once more the girl, Marmoset, and Dragon had the terrace to themselves. Taking advantage of her solitude, Dane went down and around the side of the steps, where the raised wall of the terrace met the ground. Out of sight of this niche, she slid off her surcoat, folding it neatly and giving it to Kitten to cold. Zek she placed in an opening of the marble banister where he would be safe. Unencumbered, she let the garden bats come to say hello, as they had clamored to do since she had walked out into the open. They arrived a dozen at a time, to cling to her hair, dress, hands, and shoulders, 
talking in their high, clear voices. She loved bats, but had learned years ago that few humans agreed. It was always better to sit and gossip with them in private. She didn't keep them long. There were still pounds of insects for them to catch, and she ought to return to the silk and perfume air inside. She sighed as, one by one, the bats left her and wished them good hunting. More than anything, she would have liked to shape change and go with them. But she had the feeling that Alana and Numer would frown if she did. That was funny in itself, because Alana liked elegant parties far less than Dane did. And I'm getting fair tired of them myself, she murmured to Zek. Kit, would you do the neatening up trick? The dragon drew herself up. Suddenly, her eyes glowed silver. She made a soft, cooing sound. Curl by curl, Dane's hair, mussed by the small mammals that had clung to it, straightened to lie neatly under its lilac velvet ribbon. Small threads in her gown, pulled free by claws, plunged back into their proper weave once more. Little spots, the kind left by creatures who never had to worry about clothes, vanished. Creases flattened, pockets of musty odor evaporated. It never would have worked on a dress saturated with bird droppings, but it was perfect for little messes. Dane had discovered this bit of dragon magic months ago, when Kitten fixed her appearance after she'd been called from writing to hear a noble's complaint about winged horses. Thanks. The girl accepted the surcoat from the dragon and donned it. Why did you do it so quiet? You... The dragon held a claw to her muzzle, signaling Dane to hush, and pointed to the terrace behind them. Confused, Dane peered through the openings in the rail. In the shadows where Terrace met building, hidden from the view of those inside, was the old slave woman. Perched on the rail in front of her, talking softly and fiercely, was Rakosh. Dane frowned. She wasn't sure which was odder, the conversation itself, or the parties to it. Why would Rakosh talk to a slave? Any slave. He was hopping in fury, waving his wings as he tried to make a point. The slave shook her head. A slave? Refusing an order from anyone? Something else troubled Dane. She was sure this was the slave she had seen that morning, but now the woman's shaved head was covered by stubbly hair. Her rough gown hung from both shoulders, not just one, and her sandals were leather, not straw. They laced all the way up to those bony knees. Suddenly the old woman produced a gleaming silver cup. Showing it to her cosh, she rattled it, producing the unmistakable sound of dice. Dane collected Zek and marched up the short flight of steps, kitten beside her. Rakosh would get the poor old thing into trouble, and the gods alone knew what might happen to her if one of her masters saw this. Seven, the slave remarked. She and Rakosh stared at the flat surface of the rail beside the upended dice cup. You win, for now. She turned and winked at the approaching Dane. Push this bad boy off the rail, there's a dear, she said. He's going to beat a poor old lady out of her life savings. Grabbing the dice cup, she placed a hand on the rail and nimbly vaulted over. When Dane ran to stare down at her probable landing site, sure the woman had broken an ankle at least, she was nowhere to be seen. "'Who was that?' demanded the girl of Rakosh. "'What were you doing with her?' The immortal's eyes danced. "'You saw her? Who was she?' "'The poor old slave they made clean my rooms this morning!' The stormwind guffawed. "'Oh, indeed?' he said when he had calmed down. "'Well, if you want to believe that, go right ahead. You'll learn.' There's something you're not telling me. No, it's her. Ask her what she's not telling you. And be careful. She's tricky. Something glittered on the rail where the dice cup had been. It was a metal feather. Are you molting? Asked Dane. Do you molt? You don't look like you lost a feather. Never mind that, he snapped. The girl shrugged and turned to go. No, wait, please. She moved to stand up wind of him. Well, she asked when he didn't seem inclined to speak again. Anything? He remained silent, frowning in thought. You left in a hurry before. I would apologize for my rudeness if I had manners. Happily, I don't. You ought to try our shape sometime. People expect you to be crude. I'm told it's liberating for most humans. She snorted. You won't catch me that way. Numer warned me what happens when humans take on the shape of immortals. We can't change back. Wanted to try dragon shape, did you? She stuck her tongue out at him and he smiled. I wasn't lying about the stormings in the menagerie. She fiddled with the feather on the rail, careful not to touch the edges. If it was one of his, it would cut better than a knife. I know. I saw them, Barza and Habek. They told me how they came to be there. I'm sorry. 
I am angry, not sorry. Jacon lied when he took over our flock. He said he killed Barza and Hebek in combat, and their bodies dropped into one of your oceans. Rakash had begun to rock from foot to foot. His green eyes sparkled angrily as his feathers bristled. We believed him because we were tired of battles. Stormwings, tired of battles. We betrayed her, just as he did, and to find this smiling, lying mortal in league with him. Humans came onto the terrace. Globe sailed overhead to light the darkness. Ozern was in the forefront, with Alana on his arm and Duke Gareth on his other side. Seeing them, he came over. Follow my lead, Rakash muttered softly. Please. She looked at him, puzzled, but nodded. She didn't think he would get her into trouble, enemy or no. She did have to admit their talks here weren't hostile, more like the exchange between friends who enjoyed a good argument. That was enough to make her head spin. Verla Dane and Lord Rakosh, said the Emperor, smiling mischievously. Now here is an odd pairing. We heard this young lady hates Stormwings. The Immortal shrugged. We value a good enemy, Imperial Majesty. If I may be permitted to say so, opponents come in many guises. It is well to get to know them all. The Emperor nodded. Alana frowned, looking from him to Rakosh to Dane. The girl shrugged to let her friend know that she hadn't the least idea of what the Stormwing meant. Forgive me for my departure earlier, but I had thought of a gift to make to you, as a personal token of my appreciation for our association. It will be my very great pleasure if you would accept it. Rakash nodded toward the feather. Give it to him, if you please. Dane carefully picked up the feather and offered it to Ozorn, who smiled and took it, holding it with care. Is some particular virtue attached to this gift? he asked. Indeed, replied the Stormwing. Any such token from an immortal has... qualities. Dane touched her throat, brushing the chain for the badger's claw. Heed me, Rakosh went on. If ever you are in peril of life and throne, and it must be peril that drives you, not curiosity, take this feather and thrust it into your flesh. When it mixes with your blood, you will fly from your enemies as if winged with steel and escape beyond the Black God's reach for all time. Ozorn replied evenly, Neither our life nor our throne is in peril, Lord Rakosh, nor do we believe they ever will be. Our hold on our empire is firm indeed. But the wheel turns, Rakosh answered. What is up may come down. What is brought low may rise. The gods are not fickle, but they have been known to change their minds. One day you will know the value of Stormwing esteem. He bowed to the Emperor, then looked at Dane. I never know what to make of you, he replied dryly. I suppose I never will. He took off and vanished into the dark. Dane watched for the last sweep of his wings. You aren't alone, she thought. The sun was not even above the horizon when she woke the next morning. It would be an hour or more before Numa and the others began to stir, and Kitten and Zek were still deep in slumber. With no mind to go back to sleep and no books to read, she decided to visit the Emperor's birds. Leaving the dragon in Marmoset, she asked the mousers and rat catchers for a path to the aviary. The one they gave her took her through gardens to a door in a glass wall. It was open, with no magical lock to undo. She slipped inside and closed the door softly behind her. The first to come meet her were small green birds with red faces and tails, called parrot finches. They eyed her from a branch several yards away before dropping to her shoulders. The next arrivals were unlike any bird she'd ever seen. Finches who looked as if they had rolled on an artist's paintboard, sporting red, yellow, orange, or black faces, aqua collars and tails, emerald wings, yellow bellies, and purple breasts. Twittering, they hopped on nearby twigs and on her fingers, eyes bright in their vivid faces. What had she done to herself to be dressed as a dirt walker? they asked. I was born this way, she told them silently, hearing quiet male voices from the direction of the door into the palace. I'm a two-legger and people. The finches were not sure they approved. Red-crested cardinals arrived. With them came tanagers whose plumage shimmered green and gold or green and blue. None of the birds could remember much of their first encounter with Dane. They had been too sick. Now they inspected her eagerly. Greetings over, a tanager pair invited Dane to come see their nest. Finding the stair nearby, she accepted the invitation, ascending as quietly as she could. Most of the birds stayed with her. 
though some left to get food. Chattering, being rude to their companions, they explained that the man fed them and talked to them. He came at all hours, but he didn't wake them if it was dark, but he always brought their favorite treats in his pockets. Dane shook her head. The more she saw or heard of the Emperor, the more confused she felt. At the topmost level of the aviary, she found a very small colony of leaf birds, some with blue-violet stripes breaking their bodies into halves, the top green and the bottom orange gold, some with orange heads and red edges to their wings. Here, too, were royal bluebirds, who appeared drab until they turned in the light to reveal wings and tails of a blue so intense it seemed to glow. She was beginning to see why humans from the western islands to the eastern kingdoms of the roof of the world came to see the emperor's aviary. These birds were like feathered jewels. She also noted the care they received, which impressed her more than all the emperor's wealth. Checking the sun's position, she saw there was plenty of time before she needed to return for breakfast. I'm going to change, she told her new friends. Don't worry, I won't hurt anyone. Removing her boots, she crouched on the platform and closed her eyes, remaking herself as a starling. Her body shrank swiftly, clothes falling away. She sprouted bronze and black speckled feathers and grew a yellow beak. Her legs became stilts, her feet three long toes. Done, she ruffled her feathers and cackled, then took to the air. The leaf birds joined her. The parrot finches came behind, twittering in their eagerness to show her the nooks and crannies they had discovered. The birds had nests tucked everywhere in this huge room. Not only had they made use of the trees and bushes that were natural choices, but they had built in the joints of the enameled green metal strips that supported the panes of glass forming the ceiling and most of the walls. Only one wall was stone. This the birds followed down, headed for the man and his treats. While the food and water dishes throughout the aviary were kept full, the man always had something extra good. She was so wrapped up in the flock that she nearly followed them to beg a treat from Osorn. Only when she saw him in a newly arrived companion did she back up hurriedly, almost colliding with the finches. The emperor would know a starling did not belong with his exotic treasures. She perched, concealing herself in a clump of leaves. Osorn's companion was Numer. Once out of view, she changed the shape of her head and ears, becoming more like an owl than a starling. Now she could hear the men clearly. Check the baths and the gardens, and she is nowhere to be found. If she is here and you are concealing her from me... Be assured, Draper, she is not here. We had hoped she would be to see how our birds have improved. If they have, then you have no further need of her. We all prefer that you leave her in peace. We are inclined to give her grace and favor. Osorn's tone was haughty. She has served us well, and we wish to reward her. She requires no rewards for your providing, your imperial majesty. Never before had the girl heard Numer sound this harsh. She is well enough as she is. Such heat over a girl child, and one without family or connection to recommend her. Why concern yourself in her affairs? You will forget she exists the moment some rare tome of magic comes into your hands, or some arcane toy. That has always been your way. You take up with someone, make them feel you are their sworn friend, then turn on them the moment you have what you wanted from them. How like you to see it in those terms, retorted Numer. She is my student. You will never understand that. You never could sustain so profound a tie. Once you gained your throne, you decided you no longer required mere human bonds. Stop it, Numer, Dane thought, watching the Emperor's eyes flicker with some odd emotion. Can't you see he wants to upset you? Human bonds, Osorn said quietly, studying gilded nails. I am certain you and your lovely student have a most profound bond. Must you share a bed with her animals, as well as with her? Numer's hand lashed and slammed against the suddenly visible sheet of emerald fire that appeared around the Emperor. Lights flared where he struck. He yanked his hand back, rubbing it. If you interfere with her, if you harm her in any way, it will be a breach of the peace accords. His breath came hard under the words, All of the eastern lands will unite to destroy you. He stalked out of the aviary, dark cheats burning crimson. Dane was breathless. What had possessed him to hit Osorn? The suggestion that Numer was interested in her for sexual reasons had been made before. He'd laughed it off. If anyone took offense over such things, it was Dane herself, and only because the speaker did not understand Numer was too honorable ever to take advantage of her. The Emperor remained oddly still for several long moments after Numer's exit. 
Wondering if he were in a trance, she changed once more until she looked at him with an eagle's eyes. Now she saw fine pearled sweat on Osorn's face. The pupils of his eyes had opened all the way up, in defiance of the light that streamed through the glass walls. His breathing came deep and soft, his mouth trembled slightly. Slowly he lifted his right hand and held it palm up. Emerald light and four different streamers spiraled from the air before him, forming a small and fiery cyclone in his open palm. Bit by bit it solidified into a human shape. It was Numer, dressed in rags, hair tumbling around his face. When the image was complete, Ozorn, left hand palm down, began to crush it. The image shrieked, its tiny voice a perfect copy of Numer's own. It screamed and screamed as Ozorn bore down. The Emperor was smiling. Dane fled to her clothes. She heard the image's cries as she became human, dressed, and left the aviary as silent as she could. Racing back to the guest wing, even with her hands over her ears, she thought the screams followed her. Numer said nothing when she came late to breakfast, picking at his food as she told the others she'd paid a pre-dawn visit to the aviary and gotten lost coming back. If anyone noticed that she barely ate, or that she trembled so hard that she spilled her juice, they made no comment. Afterward, as they were preparing to go, Numer said, Dane, you asked to speak to me alone. Let's go to my room. Alana heard. Then I go too. It isn't needful. It's just a magic thing, explained the girl. She'd prefer to confront him about what she'd seen with no witnesses. If you visit a man's room, you need a chaperone. The lady knight shook her head. Really, Numer, you know Carthikis. They think an unveiled woman is no better than she ought to be. Until we leave here, you can't talk with her unless she's chaperoned, or you can manage it in public. A fine thing when I can't talk to my student alone, said Numer, red-faced. Let's go, then. Inside his room, Dane smelled perfume in the air, a mixed flower scent she recognized. Did Varys have a chaperone? She muttered to Alana. The woman kicked her lightly. Perhaps she didn't want one for what she was here to do. Dane scowled. A midwife's daughter, she knew very well that men enjoyed going to bed with women they weren't necessarily married to. Lately, the knowledge that Newmore had such affairs had begun to irk her. She didn't want to mention that to him. She was afraid he'd laugh. Once inside, the door closed. Numer spoke a word. Black fire bloomed in every corner, covering the windows and door. It's safe now. He sat on the bed next to Alana. Talk. Dane told them what the badger had said, and reminded Numer of her cautious words. It's hardly new, the maid said once she was done. Seers throughout the eastern and southern lands have been giving warnings of some disaster that looms over Karthik. Without better information, we have no reason to break off the talks and return home. Have you such information? Dane shook her head. Next time, tell the badger he must be more specific if the warning is to be of any use. What about that breath thing the badger did? Alana inquired. Do you know what it is? Oh, I know, said Dane grimly. And I don't like it. Not one bit. A damn animal was on display in this room as well as in hers. Not a tiger, but a stuffed king vulture, fully two and a half feet long. It was posed on a tall pedestal in one corner. The purples, reds, oranges, and yellows of its head were as bright as if the huge bird were still alive. Dane went over and removed the handkerchief someone had put over its skull. Looking at it, she saw that the fine cambric bore a delicately embroidered initial. V. Scowling, she thrust it into her pocket and looked at the adults. Here's what the badger did. She rubbed her palms on her breeches, then grasped the vulture with both hands. Light blazed around her fingers, blinding her. She blinked rapidly, trying to clear her vision. But the first hint that she had succeeded came when a wing brushed her ear. When the spots were gone, she found the vulture leaning forward, his many-colored face inches from hers. Dane smiled. Hello, she told him. I need to sit. Her knees quivered. She went to the bed. When sitting, she put her head between her knees to hold off a faint.